you, Lord Jesus. Glory to your name, Lord. Glory to your name. Father, we thank you there's no need that we have in life, nothing that we lack that you have not made provision for. Father, if we have lack of joy, we thank you the joy of the Lord is our strength. Father, in this crazy, confused world, if we lack peace, we thank you that Jesus himself is our peace. He calms the storms. Father, if we're filled with pain, we thank you that Jesus is our healer. And Father, if we have lack, any lack, any need, we thank you that we've never seen your righteous forsaken nor your seed begging bread, that Lord, you always provide spirit, soul, and body. And so, Father, we thank you for your generous hand of provision today. We thank you we have all that we need to live a life of thriving in Jesus Christ. Just say it out loud. I have everything I need to live a thriving life, a joy-filled life, a faith-filled life in Jesus Christ. Let's give him a shout of thanks for that right now. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Praise the name of Jesus. He's so good. We'll turn to three or four people and greet your neighbor. Take a minute and say hello. Tell them they look nice. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. God is good. Uh, we want to greet everybody that's with us visiting today. We have a lot of folks watching online uh, from various states, um, all over the United States, here in New York, upstate New York, different places around the world. We just want to welcome you. Thank you for being with us in this service today. Let's give a big shout out to all of our online guests. Great to have you here today. And uh, we want to greet everybody that's here visiting for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time. We're glad that you're with us here at Abundant Life today. We believe God has something great for you. And uh, we're trusting God is going to minister to your heart and needs today in Jesus Christ. Thank you for being with us. We have a special area. You might have heard about it earlier. It's called the next room. It's directly outside the sanctuary doors and to the right. And for stopping to see us today, we want to uh, take a minute to give something to you, to thank you for being with us. And if you go back to that next area, our ministry leaders want to just say hello, get to hear your story, pray with you if you have any needs or prayer requests, and find out a little bit about you and bless you for being with us today. So make your way back to the next area. If you're a guest, even if this isn't your first time but you've never stopped by next, uh, make that your next stop, and you'll be blessed after service today. Praise the Lord. And I just want to announce today, before we jump into the Word of God, that uh, we are starting our Dwell Conference a week from this Tuesday night. Praise the Lord. And it is a conference uh, focusing on our relationship with the Holy Spirit, how we live in Christ and Christ living in us. And we're going to come and dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, I want to encourage you, when we have a conference, we don't do a lot of them. We usually have one big conference a year. And uh, when, you, when we do this, it's because we really want you to experience the presence of God. And you can take ground sometimes spiritually in a shorter period of time when you come and saturate in the presence of God. So we want you to come and saturate. Tuesday night, I'll be opening the conference. Brother Rick Renner will be, a, will be with us Wednesday morning, Wednesday night. Uh, David Ireland will be with us Thursday night. Some other great ministers and communicators. But don't come for the speaker. Come for the presence of God. Doesn't matter who's here. Praise the Lord. And every night we'll be ministering the word. Every morning we'll be teaching how to live a life that's thriving in the presence of God. And then we have these amazing workshops that will help you to really go deeper in your walk with God. If you want to take ground spiritually, jump into the Dwell Conference. Uh, if you're going to take time off work, I can't think of anything better to take time off work uh, for than dwell, to come and dwell in the presence of God. And the Lord is going to do great and mighty things. We're believing that God's going to heal the sick. He's going to give direction to those who need clarity, need to hear the voice of God, that you're going to sense the presence of God and get direction for your life in this new year. Praise the Lord. So dwell starts again a week from Tuesday night, February 6th. Hope to see you here every night at 7, every morning at 10, and then, of course, our workshops at noon. So how many of you brought your Bible with you this morning? 
If you haven't, lift it up and let's begin by thanking and praising God for his word today. Father, we thank you for the word. We declare it is living, it is powerful. We thank you that it works for us. Father, I pray today that every heart would be open to everything that you want us to hear. Lord, help us to recognize who we are now that we are in Christ Jesus. And Father, let us walk in the fullness of what you provided in the new birth, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, this morning, and we're going to open today uh, with that passage we've been looking at, Romans 5.17. We've been talking about what the Bible has to say about God's righteousness, the gift of God's righteousness. And last week, we talked about the fact that we have to receive the righteousness of God, and that we ended by discussing how God transfers his perfect righteousness into us and into our hearts. And so we're going to build on that today. We want to talk about your righteous spirit. Everybody say, I have a spirit. Now, the Bible teaches that humanity, God made man uh, as an entity, a single entity, but within man, there are three constituent parts of humanity. Just like there is a trinity in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in man, there is a trinity. And each part of that aspect of humanity is important to God. And I want you to realize that when God made us, he, he formed our body out of the earth. He breathed into our bodies, the Bible said, the breath, the breath, or ruach, the spirit of life, his own spirit. He breathed into the body and made a human spirit. And the Bible says he became a living soul, which means conscious feeling, emotional, and intellectual being. And those are the three parts of humanity. We are spirits living in bodies, and we possess intellect, emotion, and mind, also known as the soul. And because of that, we need to understand how God's saving work comes into our lives in all three aspects of our being. Now, Romans 5.17 says this, For if by one man's offense or sin... Death reigned through that one, and that, of course, we know is Adam. Adam's sin caused death to reign in this world over all of us. His sin opened the door for all of us to be infected with sin. He said, how much more shall those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? And I love that last statement, reign in life. God wants us to not be dominated by life, but to reign in life. He wants us to reign and rule over our enemies, over our circumstances. He wants us to win in life. That doesn't mean we're not going to have moments where we lose. It doesn't mean we're not going to struggle. We're not going to have problems. We all have those. We don't have to teach you about that because we all know we live in that. This world has not been changed yet. But when Jesus came into the world, he came to begin his restoration of the universe by focusing on the human spirit, the human man. He wanted to begin by bringing new life first into humanity. Because as man sinned, he opened the door to sin for the entire planet. So God decided to deal with the sin problem by starting with humanity first. And that's why God sent Jesus. So that Jesus could take our place. As God, he represents the power of infinity, and as man, Jesus became a human so that he could represent us to God. And on the cross, Jesus was that great bridge between the perfect, righteous, holy Father and fallen, broken, sinful humanity. And Jesus, in his humanity, didn't die for his own sins. He died for our sins. God took the sins of us, of humanity, and placed them on the humanity of Jesus. And in his human body, he suffered once for all sins. Paul puts it this way in Romans or 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who never knew sin to become sin for us. He became sin. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 that as Jesus hung on the cross, he became a curse for us. He didn't, wasn't cursed because of his own sin. It was our sin that deserves the curse. Jesus took our sin. He took our shame. He took our curse. God laid upon him, according to the prophet Isaiah, the iniquity of us all. And Jesus felt for a moment in history the wrath of God, not for himself, but for us 
as a human substitute. Jesus was our substitute. Just as Adam represented us before God in the garden and bought sin for all of us, Jesus represented us before God on the cross and purchased righteousness for all of us. He took our sin and he had one hand on heaven and he took from God, the gift of righteousness, and when a person believes in the message of Jesus, you are actually transferred to that moment in history where Jesus is touching God in humanity. And in that moment, your sins are transferred to the cross of Christ and paid for fully and completely by Jesus. And Christ's righteousness and God's gift of Christ's righteousness is transferred to you, and you receive by faith what you could never achieve in your lifetime. Perfect, right standing with God. That is what the new birth is all about. That's what being a Christian is. It's receiving the free gift of God's right standing. Not through our own works, but through the finished work of Christ. And folks, the more we recognize what he did for us, the more we meditate on what he's given us, the stronger we will become in our identity. Now, we're living in a world today that has an identity crisis. I mean, everywhere you look, people are trying to figure out who they are. Uh, more and more, you see people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s and uh, saying, I don't know who I am. I, I have to find myself. And I understand that in a lot of ways in life, if we don't have a clear sense of identity, we can get stuck in things that don't really feel like us. And there comes points in life where we need to reorient. We need to find ourselves, so to speak. But, and we can lose our sense of identity. But I want you to know this. You're not going to find yourself in a 10-week vacation in Tuscany. You're not going to find yourself in some uh, Buddhist monastery in, Tim, in, in Tibet. You're not going to find yourself going and, and you know, smoking askaya or whatever that stuff is down in Mexico that makes you throw up and give you visions. You're not going to find yourself simply by going into a counseling office, okay? I want you to know this. I don't, we're not against counseling. But you have to find yourself, your true self, your true nature will never be found in someone else or some external thing. And the whole world is trying to find, solve their own identity crisis by creating communities and creating identities that are related to things like their passions, their hobbies, their, their lusts, their desires. And uh, because my body desires this, this is who I am. I am this. People are even identifying themselves simply based on their physical appearance or ethnic appearance or, or ethnic background. And while that's wonderful to know what your ethnicity is, to be proud of your family heritage, uh, to understand uh, what people who, who are of the same ethnicity deal with and, and learn how to walk and navigate in that, there's nothing wrong with that. You will never elevate to the level that God wants you to if you simply see yourself based on the color of your skin the tribe that you come from, the side of the tracks you come from, the group you hang with, all of these external things, even physical things, are just body things. You, at your core, are not a body. You are a spirit being made in the image and the likeness of God. Everything else, as wonderful and as exciting as it may be to understand, is secondary to that. You will never find your true peaceful identity simply by looking at the group and saying, this is my group. You have to recognize in Christ, the only ultimate group that gives us identity is the body of Christ. When we come into Jesus, he gives us a new nationality, a new race. We become new people because he does an actual miraculous work inside of us. Now, last week I made this statement and I'm gonna build on it today. Uh, Christianity, I, I maintain, is the only major religious system that makes the claim and ardently teaches that when a person becomes an adherent or a follower of the faith, the Christian faith, they don't just receive a list of do's and don'ts, moral behaviors and standards. They don't just receive community within an identified group. They don't just get an opportunity to work for heaven or whatever that conceived version of, of perfection is. But we teach that when a person comes to Jesus Christ, there is an actual, literal, miraculous thing that happens inside the human heart. 
This is important. It's not just a change of your thinking and your feelings. There is something past your body, past your mind, and it is your spirit. And in that core part of you, there is a change. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May the God of peace sanctify, set you apart, wholly or completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Son of Man. I'm going to say it again. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, may the God of peace himself sanctify, complete you holistically, completely. And Paul is praying a blessing over the believer that every aspect of their being would be finished, completed, unified. And then he divides us into the three constituent parts of humanity. He said, may your whole spirit And then he uses the word and soul and body be preserved, blameless, that means without sin, at the coming of the Son of Man. That has a reference to when Jesus returns. Now this tells us something. In salvation... God's work was to purchase for us a complete blamelessness, a complete salvation that affects spirit, soul, and body, all three of our constituent parts. And God's purpose is to take these and to present you blameless when Jesus returns. Now, we read the Bible, and sometimes you'll notice people will say, well, the Bible seems to indicate that we are saved, and it certainly does, and we are. If you're born again, if you've accepted Christ, you are saved. But there's other passages in the Bible that indicates that we are being saved. We are being saved. We're in a process of salvation. And then there are passages in the Scripture that seem to indicate we have yet to be saved. And and so there's debate. And there has been historically about are we actually saved, are we sort of saved but in a process, or are we going to be saved at the end? In fact, there's a whole group of Protestant theologians right now that are really focusing on the fact you're really not saved until the day of the resurrection. That's when your salvation comes. Up Between now and your death, we'll see. Right? You have to live, you have to live and live continuously and faithfully and perfectly. When you die, uh, then... When the resurrection happens, then your your salvation comes in the future. That's really your eternal life. And there's a great debate about that. And I want you to understand the problem with so many of these debates is that they force us to, to have to make a decision between two things that should not be either or. Binary decisions are sometimes not the best decisions. And very often the truth is both and. It includes all three of these. So I'm going to say this to you. According to the New Testament... According to the New Testament, if you are a Christian, if you are truly a believer in Jesus Christ, you are saved. You are absolutely saved, and we're going to show you this today. But in another sense, you are being saved. And in yet a further sense, you have yet to be saved. Now, how does this work? It works in, concur- in concurrence with the three parts of your nature. And God didn't start with your body. He ends with your body at the resurrection. He started with your spirit because you are a spirit. And when a person is born again, they become fully, completely, eternally saved. In your spirit nature. Then it is your duty as a born again believer to go through the process of letting your soul. Now, what is the difference between your spirit and soul? And that's really the question. Because in the inner man, the part of you that is invisible, it indicates that there are two parts of us there's both a spirit and a soul. And this soul is being saved. It's in a process of being delivered. And in the body, we have yet to be saved. Everybody say, yet to be saved. 
This will happen when Jesus returns. And even if you and I, if we pass away, if we go to heaven, if we die physically before Christ returns, our spirits, the real us, leaves our physical bodies and goes to be with Christ. We know this because Paul said, if I depart my body, I will go to be with Christ, which is far better. When you, lo- when you physically die, you go to be with Jesus. Your born-again spirit is united with Christ. Praise the Lord. Your body goes into the grave. But God has marked your body. And what Jesus did on the cross is not just create a salvation for your disembodied spirit, but the ultimate goal is to allow what he did in your spirit to fully work in your mind and emotions and live in your body. And in the day of Jesus Christ, all three of these will be preserved together, blameless at the coming of the Son of Man. Hallelujah. So that's our hope. And why do we say this? Because our faith teaches us a lot about our future. And we need to realize if you are a Christian, this is your glorious future. Someday you won't just be with Jesus in heaven without the flesh, without sin. Someday you are going to return and God is going to reconstruct your physical body from the elements, and it's going to be a new body that is incapable of sin, that is incapable of disease, that is incapable of death, a body that is a fit vessel for your human spirit, and you are going to be a glorified spiritual being. You're going to live in a, you're going to live in a body that never dies. This is exciting, and the Bible says our new bodies will be like Christ's body, resurrected, glorious, filled with glory. That's our future. Hallelujah. In the meantime, because of sin, there is a line, a distinction, a demarcation. You see, sin has separated us into our constituent parts. When when Adam and Eve sinned, sin affected, first of all, their spirit, their inner person. Their inner spirit that was connected to God lost that connection. The Bible calls this spiritual death. Now, death never means the cessation of existence. We think of something die, they are no more. In the Bible, death never refers to never existing again, especially as it relates to humans. Death is simply the separation of the spirit and the body. Death is separation, okay? When a person dies spiritually, it's not that their spirits are no longer there, but their spirits are are separated from God. And so humans are born with spiritual entities that have been affected by sin that we inherit and they are separated from God. Everybody say, my spirit is separated from God before I receive Christ. That's what spiritual death is. It doesn't mean you don't have a spirit. It means your spirit is now separated and there isn't a complete union as God designed it. As a result of spiritual death, Adam and Eve began to die in their soul. And this word soul we've studied before is the Greek word psyche or suke. And it's where we get the word mind. It refers to the mind, the emotions, the intellect, human volition or will. This is the soul, okay? And so when Adam and Eve fell spiritually, you can begin to see how it impacted their emotions. When God comes into the garden and he interviews Adam and asks him, you know, where are you? And and Adam was hiding, and, he, and, and God says, you know, why were you hiding? Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to? And, and then Adam blames Eve, and you begin to see this whole blame shifting. You see their soul, their thinking, there's shame, there's fear, there's accusation. Now we start seeing a soul that is separated from its spiritual entity, from God himself. So, so spirit, when a person... Uh, when Adam and Eve died, they died spiritually. Their souls were separated from their true identity, and their bodies were affected by sin. That's represented in the story where it talks about how they knew they were naked, and they made fig leaves. They didn't know they were naked before the fall because the glory of God was their clothing. So their physical bodies changed. They were no longer uh, unsusceptible to death. They were now mortal bodies. So sin separated their spirits from God, separated their souls from one another and from themselves, and separated their bodies ultimately from physical life. So our bodies are dying. 
but they died instantly spiritually in their relationship with God. So when God decided to save humanity, he decided to start with the part of us that connects to him, the spirit. And so the first step in salvation is you and I need a new spiritual nature. We need a spirit that can manage and handle a relationship with God. Now turn to John chapter 3, and let's take a look. John chapter 3. And this is the story of Jesus interacting with a religious Jewish man named Nicodemus, a Pharisee. John chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So we start out by realizing this is a guy who's living a religious life. He's very devoted. Pharisees, they, they memorized the Torah. They were extremely devoted to the laws and to the religious system of Judaism. So this was a guy who externally was trying to keep all the rules and probably externally looked pretty good. But notice, he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is the problem. Because sin has affected us, spirit, soul, and body, we need a new beginning. And Jesus said, unless one is born again. Born again which indicates a second birth. There was a birth, and now there's a second birth. And in verse 5, Jesus makes that clear. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So if a person wants to enter into God's kingdom, he has to be born twice. Born of water and born of the Spirit. Now remember, born again. That means there's a first birth and a second birth. Now born of water is the, the simplest and most obvious explanation in context is physical birth. When a woman is delivering a baby, that baby is born in a sac, a membrane of waters are ruptured and there is a flow of water. The, very often the very first sign is a woman's water breaks, the water sack that that baby was in, and the baby is literally born of water. Born in water comes out uh, in, in that, with, after that amniotic fluid is released. Born of water is a physical birth. It's a reference to the physical birth of man. Unless one is born of water, that means you're born, you're a human, and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So it's not enough to be born to enter the kingdom of God. There are a lot of humans today that have been born of water. That means they've, they've, they've been born, they're living in this life, but they cannot enter the kingdom of God because what you need to enter directly into the kingdom of God is a second birth. That's why he said you must be born again. You've got to be born of water and born of the Spirit. Everybody say born of the Spirit. Your physical body was born from your physical parents, but your spirit needs a new birth. Your spirit, which is separated from God, needs a fresh birth. Everybody say, born again. Now he's going to tell us very clearly that born of water is talking about human birth, and born again is talking about spiritual birth. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh. Now in the previous verse, Jesus said, born of water. So you've got to compare these two. That's how we know that being born of water isn't referring to water baptism. It's referring to human birth. Born of the flesh. That means physically born from your physical parents. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That means your, your parents gave you a physical body. So when a baby is born, a physical mother gives birth to a physical baby, right? 
has material, has his senses. It's a material creature that can uh, navigate and access this physical world. But Jesus said, that which is born of the Spirit, everybody say the Spirit, is Spirit. So parental flesh gives birth to your physical body or physical flesh, but the new birth is being born of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is telling us that when a person is saved, when they trust in Christ, there is a literal birth that occurs in their spirit by the Holy Spirit. And this is the miracle of the new birth. Remember, I began by telling you that we claim, we, we proclaim that when a person is a Christian, they don't just get their name written in heaven. They just don't join an organization. There's an actual miracle that takes place. Their spirit is born of the Holy Spirit. It is a brand new birth. Everybody say brand new birth. So do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Now, this is important because you may be here watching or you may be watching online, and I want to say this to you. Uh, being born into the human race makes you a, a child of humanity, and, and uh, God is ultimately your creator. But God is not your personal father until you're born of the Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit give you a new heart to bring you into this new relationship with God. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to make a way so that our spirits could be born of the Spirit. And Jesus is telling us in these verses that to become a Christian is literally a spiritual birth. Your spirit is born again. Now listen, this isn't a metaphor. This isn't some kind of a concept. It's a real thing. You are a spirit. And, and if you were to... If you were to uh, die right now, and not that I'm wishing that on anybody, but if, you're, if somebody was to come and cut your head off, you would not, <laughs> just hold, stay with me, your body would be separated from your spirit. Your head would be separated from your body, and your body would be separated from your spirit. But you would not have lost your head, not you. Whatever a person does to your body, they can do to the body, but you are not your body. And when you leave your body, you're going to see that you are an entity, that you have all the component parts. The spirit person looks similar to the physical person, only perfected. And you are a spirit being living in a physical body. We know that the spiritual being has fingers, has a voice, has a, has a form. We know this from Luke 16 when the Bible describes the rich man and Lazarus in the afterlife and talks about, it talks about their physical appearance. They are, you, you look, you are a, an entity. You're not like a cloud of smoke. You're not some ball of light. You are in form like your physical body. The thing is, your physical body formed around your spiritual body. But if your, spirit, your physical body dies, your spiritual body continues to exist. And that's whether you're saved or unsaved. Everybody, their spiritual entity will continue forever, even after their physical body dies. The question is, will your spiritual entity exist in the kingdom of God or not? For it to exist out of your body in the kingdom of God, it has to be born a second time. It's not enough to be born a human to be saved. You've got to be born again. You need a second birth to enter the kingdom of God. And the great question that every one of us must answer is this. Am I born again? If Jesus taught I cannot enter God's kingdom unless I'm born again, have I received this miraculous birth of my human spirit? Have I been changed on the inside in my spirit nature? And every one of us have to answer that question. Being religious doesn't make you born again. Going to this church or any church does not make you born again. Being raised in a, in a, in a Christian family with born-again parents doesn't make you born again. Your born-again parents can't give you a born-again spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can give you a born-again spirit. Are you listening? You need a new birth of your, of your spiritual nature. And that's what Jesus came to do. Not just to save you from sin, but to give you a new heart, a new spirit, a new nature. And folks, as we talk about living in righteousness, it's important that we keep in mind, and this is why I'm spending time on this, that we're not telling you to be something you're not. We're teaching you 
who you are if you are in Christ Jesus. And the more you know who you are in your true nature, in your inner nature, the easier it will be for you to deal with the problems and struggles in your outer nature, in your flesh, and even in your mind. Because we have a battle that now occurs once you're born again. Now let's look at a few verses uh, because I want you to see this in the scripture. Uh, First of all, take a look with me at... um, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 22, it says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Verse 23, having been, look at this term, born again. Not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God that lives and abides forever. Notice he uses this term again, having been born again. He's saying since you were born again, and that new birth is of an incorruptible seed. So the, one of the, I'm going to give you some characteristics of your new born again spirit. First of all, it's born of incorruptible seed. When you hear the word of God, the seed of the word is sown in your heart. When you believe that, that seed gives birth to a new spirit within you. The Holy Spirit uses the seed of the word, kind of just like your physical body has the seed of the husband and the body of the wife to give birth to your physical body. It's the seed of God's word and the movement and your faith in the Holy Spirit combines to give birth to a born-again spirit, to a new spirit. And that spirit is born of incorruptible seed, which cannot fade away. It lives and abides forever. I'm so thankful that what God put in me, his nature put in me, is an incorruptible nature. It, that means the devil can't corrupt it, others can't corrupt it, even the world can't corrupt it. And I'm going to say this, you can't corrupt it. Because it's the seed of God. Now let's keep looking at this new nature. What does the Bible say about it? The Bible says that this new nature has been regenerated. A regeneration. Of the spirit. Look at this verse. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. You have been saved, not by works of righteousness, which you have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice you have a regenerated spirit. This word, uh, palingenesis, genesis, means to once again be born. It's very similar to the idea of being born again, to regenerate, to regrow something that needs to exist that didn't exist before. This Bible tells us that we are regenerated in our spirit, and it's by the renewing, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, and there's this washing that occurs. So when a person is born again, your spirit is washed. Everybody say washed. That means it's scrubbed of its sin, and the new spirit, the regenerated spirit, doesn't have the nature that the old spirit had. The Bible tells us that when you're born again, you're born of God's own seed. And I want you to look at this, 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to use this phrase, the nature of God himself. Notice what John says in 1 John 3. The first verse says this, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Everybody say children of God. Therefore the world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. See, coming into Christ makes you an actual child of God. And yes, in one sense, we're adopted into the family of God, 
but we're not just adopted into the family of God. Our spirits are actually recreated with the very seed of God himself. Notice in verse 8, it says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil are sin. Whoever has been born of God, read it with me, does not sin. Now, the phrase whoever is the Greek word pas, which means all that are born of God. Every, anything that is born of God does not sin. Why? Because his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he's been born of God. This is, a, this is a, a, an interesting, this is almost like a proverb where you have a statement, an explanation, then a second explanation, then you come back to the statement. He that is born of God does not sin. And he cannot sin because his seed remains in him because he's born of God, right? So born of God. Now, I want you to take a look at this word seed. This is an interesting word. This word seed... See if you recognize it when I write it. What word is that? Sperma. It's where we get the English word sperm. The sperm is the seed of a man that carries the DNA of the father. When God wanted us to understand, when John wanted us to understand what it means to be born again, he wanted us to understand that we didn't just get adopted and we don't just have an alien righteousness that's given to us graciously, but that literally something happens inside of you when you're born again and his seed, his sperma, his DNA remains. This Greek word remains is the word dwells. It's the Greek word meno and it means to live inside of continuously, continuously. His, this is, this is powerful. The seed of God lives in you, remains in you. The seed of God. This is powerful. You wouldn't suggest this if it wasn't in the word of God. Being born again means that you have the very nature and life of God transferred into your inner spirit just as real as your physical body carries the DNA of your physical parent. If you're born again, your new spiritual nature carries the DNA of your spiritual father, God. This is why we're saying when you're a child of God, you have a dis- there's a change in your relationship with God. He's not just creator and judge. He's now father because literally when you heard the word of God and you believed it, God's seed, his DNA, went inside of you and recreated a brand new spiritual nature that didn't just give you, he didn't just give you a new nature, he remains in you. His DNA remains in you. The nature of God remains in you. And that part of you, that part of you that is born of God cannot sin because it's been born of God. You see, the part of you that's born again doesn't want to sin. If you're a Christian, there is inside of you Not just in your mind and knowledge I should do right, but in you there is a new spiritual nature that carries the DNA of God himself that wants to do what's right. And I'm belaboring this because I want you as believers to think of yourselves as born-again spirits living in physical bodies, not as physical beings trying to have a spiritual experience. You are born again. You have eternal life. The seed of God remains in you, and it must because you're born of God. That means God is your Father. And there's a part of you that he sealed his salvation into that even you can't mess up. And so now, I'm not telling, if this is really important, I kind of talked about this last week, but a lot of Christians kind of see the, the inner man, you've got the outer man, you know, that's the body, and then the inner man, 
and they, they, they use this idea of soul, and they don't see the difference between soul and spirit. It's just all kind of the same thing. So they say that you are still a sinner in your heart. Your heart is wicked. But there's this little, the Holy Spirit is in you, and he's given you his nature. So inside of you, there's this really bad, wicked heart, but the Holy Spirit is kind of floating around in there, okay? Um, and, and what's really difficult when you study the Reformers and almost everything written about this topic of regeneration, it's deficient in what the Scripture actually teaches, that's why we cannot see soul and spirit as the same thing. That's why the New Testament and the letters of Paul and Peter make it very clear the soul and the spirit are not the same thing. Because the inner part of you is made up of soul and spirit. All right? The soul is the mind operating through the body, the emotions operating through your body and experiences. It's your volition, your human volition, this is your intellectual self. We sometimes use the word mind, and in that we mean emotions. That's your soul, okay? God cares about your soul, which is how you're thinking, how you're feeling, where your headspace is. But when you're born again, it's not your soul that is born again. It's your spirit that is born again. Your soul must now go through a process of being saved. Remember I said, when you're born again, your spirit is saved, but now your soul is being saved, which is your mind now has to change to think like your new nature in your spirit. Praise God. And once the mind gets renewed to who you are in Christ, then the spirit can, through the soul, govern the body. But if you think that you're just kind of this half-saved, half-unsaved, wicked sinner that's got the Holy Spirit floating around, bumping around inside of you sometimes, and every good thing is just the Holy Spirit, you're going to miss the work of God. He didn't just give you, God didn't just put the Holy Spirit in you. He gave you a new spirit. And that new spirit has the presence of the Holy Spirit on the inside of it. So this is the real you. It is a born Again, spirit. There is no sin nature in your new spirit. I remember in 1989, uh, Billy Graham was coming to uh, speak here in Syracuse, back at the height of his uh, just you know, the height of his ministry, and I was a part of a group of pastors that uh, were asked to prepare the way. So we took nine months to get ready for the Graham Crusades that came later that year. And I uh, remember the first, we were, had to go through these trainings so that we could help the people who came to Christ. And, and I remember the very first training, we sat down in a big church nearby, and, and uh, the grand people got up, and this guy began to teach. And he said, listen, the first thing we need to know is this, your heart is desperately wicked. He quoted a verse from Jeremiah, the heart of man is desperately wicked, who can know it? And he said this, your heart is wicked. You can't trust your heart because your heart is wicked. And so all we have is the Holy Spirit. And I remember sitting right there thinking, if being born again doesn't change my heart, my true nature, then why did I get born again? See, you don't have two natures in your spirit. You have one new nature in your spirit. It's a born-again nature. It is righteous. It is holy. That part of you that is born again and preserved by the seed of God forever, that part of you is connected with God. The problem is you have your new nature in this body that is full. That's where sin really resides is in the body. And in the mind, when the mind is, is, is conditioned to think according to the flesh. That's why the Bible tells us we've got to change the way we think. The struggle for the Christian life isn't to try to get a new, try to get, you know, the wickedness in your heart to be diminished so the Holy Spirit can be bigger. No. You're born again, you instantly have a brand new spirit. The struggle now is as a born again believer, you have to now renew your soul, your mind and your emotions. This is the battle and you've got to learn to distinguish between your new nature and the flesh nature that's in your body. The real struggle you and I have is with the flesh, the body. That's why when you die, you don't have to deal with sin anymore because your body's gone. Now you do because you're still in your body. 
And the thing is, you're either going to let your body dominate you or you're going to learn who you are in Christ and then begin to learn how to manage and master your body. Your body makes an excellent servant but a lousy master. And that's why the Bible calls Christians to not be carnal. Don't be body ruled, be spiritual, be spirit ruled. So if you're born again, I want you to know the righteousness of God is not just kind of floating around in you along with your own wickedness. Your spirit, the true you, is righteous. It is born again through the righteousness of Christ that's been given to you, and that's who you are. And so for us, we need to begin to think about who we are now that we are in Christ. Your mind needs to be more conscious of who you are as a born-again believer than it is of what you're struggling with in your flesh. And the more you begin to understand your new identity in Christ, the more you meditate on these verses and let them become a part of you, the more you realize that is the true you. When you're struggling with sin, when you feel temptation, when you feel a pull, you're going to recognize that's not my spirit that wants that. That's my unrenewed mind, my emotions, because they're being dominated by this wild body I'm living in. And so since I'm not a body, I'm a spirit, I can now deal with my mortal body because I am a new creature in Christ. I'm not trying to become a new creature. I am a new creature. That's who I really am. Everything else is learning growth. Praise the Lord. And here's the thing. If a person is born again and becomes a Christian, but they're never taught the word and they're never taught who they are in Christ, they can live their whole lives struggling with an identity crisis and living out of a sense that they are only what their body feels, tastes, senses, and is pulled by, rather than realizing that inside of them all along is a brand new nature. And for everyone that's listening to me today, your spirit is jumping at what I'm saying. Because your spirit knows it's true. The problem is we taught religious thinking rather than New Testament revelation. We need to walk in the revelation of who we are in Christ. If you are born again, you are now a new creation. Old things passed away, all things have become new. You have been born of God and his sperm remains in you. And you cannot sin in your spirit because you've been born of God. You have put on the new man, Ephesians 4.24, that has been recreated to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's who you are. That which was born of the flesh is your flesh, but that which has been born of the spirit is your spirit. Hallelujah. Now everybody, let's just stand up right now and begin to praise the Lord. Go ahead. Just praise God as born again believers in Jesus. Father, we thank you for the righteousness of God that has been transferred into our spirits. We thank you that we are now new creations in Christ. Father, that we are now the children of God. We have a new nature, a new identity. We have eternal life living within us. Hallelujah. We thank you the Holy Spirit lives in our spirit. As our teacher and our guide, Spirit of God, open our eyes to see the greatness of the work that God has done in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now say this out loud. I'm born again. Because I believe that God sent Jesus to die for my sin. And he was raised from the dead. And I declare Jesus is Lord. I submit my life to him. Therefore, I am born again. The Holy Spirit has made me new. I have a new heart. I have a new spirit. I have a new nature. I was created in Christ Jesus to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for me, that I might be made right now the righteousness of God in him. So as a born-again spirit, I speak to my mind. Mind, line up with God's word. I take authority over every stray thought, every wrong feeling, 
every misguided mindset. Soul, you will line up with the Word of God. You will line up with my new nature. And say this, body, you are not my boss. I live in you, but you've been purchased by God. Someday you're going to be transformed. In the meantime, you are my servant. I am not your servant. Just look at your hands and just say, flesh, obey the word of God. In the name of Jesus, I consider my flesh dead to sin, but alive to God. In Jesus Christ, my Lord. Now lift your hands and worship and praise God right now. Just give him thanks. Everything we said is scripture. It's all from the word of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Lord, help us to learn how to live in these bodies, to not let sin reign in our bodies, but let our bodies become instruments of righteousness to you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God is so good. Next time we're going to talk about how now we control that body, how we bring it into discipline, how the Holy Spirit has given you. You've got things in you you didn't even know you had. And all you've got to do is tap into them by faith. And you're going to find that you've got powers that are available to you right now that you didn't even know you had. So don't miss next time. Praise the Lord. Have you been blessed by the word of God today? Amen. May the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may something great happen in your life this week in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that we are children of the Most High God. If you said any of those prayers for the first time or the first time in a long time, please don't be afraid. Reach out to our online chat host. They're right there live in the chat box. If you have received Christ for the first time, if you have heard any of these concepts or revelations for the first time and you have questions, the chat box is a safe place. We can pull you into a private messaging chat. We don't want to blast your business all over the internet, but we have folks, pastors, people who can answer your questions, people who can pray for you. We want to be there for you. We want to support you, not just through the word, but in person and in prayer. So thankful I'm a child of the Most High God, and the Most High God is for me. I pray that you guys go through this week in power and in confidence with who you are, with Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. And we pray that you have a victorious week, just as Pastor prayed. We love you here at Abundant Life. For all the things we have going on, check our app, Abundant Life Syracuse. Very easy to find in your app store, or our website, AbundantLife.Church. We love you guys. Thank you for sharing this time with us. We'll see you next time. Goodbye from Abundant Life Church.